So uh, we are happy to invite Professor Professor Ho uh, to give a talk here today. Uh, Professor Ho uh, comes from Shogang University in Korea, Xi'an uh, and uh, his research field uh, is uh, differential geometry, especially related to uh, a geometric flow problem. <laughs> so if you have any uh, question about uh, this topic, uh, you can talk to, to him this day. Uh, he will stay here uh, until uh, Saturday. And, and uh, uh, today he will talk on Q curvature in uh, conformal geometry. Let's welcome Professor Paul. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, and um, yeah, thank you for that. And, uh, actually, this is my first time to to visit uh, Tsinghua, and uh, so I am really happy to be here. And in this beautiful campus, I can talk about uh, mathematics. So, so I'm really happy to talk about beautiful mathematics in a beautiful campus. <laughs> yes, so uh, the title is Kill Curvature in Conformal Geometry. So I will talk about, uh, so basically two things, uh, Conformal Geometry and Q Curvature. So don't worry if you, if you don't know anything about this, at least uh, I will talk about this for the first maybe 10 minutes to, to explain what Conformal Geometry is and also I will spend some time talking about what Q Curvature is. Okay, so uh, let me start with something very basic. So uh, suppose uh, I have a uh, compact uh, n-dimensional manifold without boundary. So then uh, we can define, uh, so this is the first course in Riemannian geometry. Uh, we can define a Riemannian metric on this uh, manifold, okay? And this is nothing but an inner product on the tangent space. So which means uh, it, it satisfies these uh, three properties. So which means this is, uh, so th this is an inner product, so which means this uh, defined on the, uh, so two copies of the tangent space. And this is bilinear, which means this is linear in each variables. And it satisfies also property one and two. So it, which means this is symmetric. Uh, Gxy is equal to Gyx. And it's, uh, and it's also satisfied the positive definite properties. So which means uh, GXX is always log negative. And this is zero only when the tangent vector is zero. Yeah, I guess most of you have uh, learned this. And, uh, but at least let, let's look at an example. Okay, so suppose uh, you have the, the, the simplest uh, manifold in the whole world. This is the n-dimensional Euclidean space, Rn. Okay, so then uh, for any point on the, uh, on the, in this Euclidean space, the tangent space is nothing but uh, itself. This is, uh, in fact, uh, the same as Rn. So therefore, you can define this, this Riemannian metric. So this is defined as uh, nothing but the uh, standard in the products in Rn. So then you can verify that uh, this G is really a Riemannian metric. So you just need to verify uh, this is bilinear. This is linear in each variable. And this is symmetric, which is quite easy to see. And this is also positive definite. Okay, and if, if this is too easy for you, so we have something a little bit more complicated. And this is the sphere, which, which is also quite easy. In fact, so, uh, so if you take the, this time the manifold to be the unit sphere, oh, oh, oh typo, oh my gosh. Uh, this is unit sphere, not space, okay? Uh, so which means uh, you just take all the unit vector in uh, the n plus one Euclidean space. So this form the n-dimensional unit sphere. And uh, it's pretty easy to see uh, the tangent space at each point is uh, this this set, so I call this P perp. 
uh, P perp is uh, it contains all the vector which orthogonal or perpendicular to this uh, vector P. Okay. So looking at this picture is quite clear. Okay. So this is exactly the tangent space uh, of the sphere at P. Okay. So then you can also once again uh, this little bit. Can you see it from the back? Okay, so uh, so uh, I define this uh, Riemannian metric to be once again uh, to be the inner product. So then once again you can verify uh, this is a Riemannian metric. So this is once again my linear symmetric and also positive definite. In fact, this is the concept of an induced metric. Right? So this is metric induced from R n plus one. Okay. Uh, and so we have a very simple fact. Okay, so this fact uh, is that the following. So if you have a Riemannian metric, we call this G dot uh, on a manifold, and you have a smooth function, positive smooth function, then if you multiply these two together, so we define this new G. So this is the product of this smooth function and this Riemannian metric. So then this is also a Riemannian metric. So to, to verify this, once again, is very simple. You just check this is still bilinear, and this is still symmetric, and this is also positive definite, coming from the fact that this is positive. Okay. Yeah, okay, got it. Okay. So and in fact, this is the concept of conformal. Okay. So we say that G, a, a metric G is conformal to G naught. If, if you can write these two metrics uh, in, in this form. Okay. And so, of course, you may ask if this is the first time you saw this, then you, you should ask why, why conformal? Why, why do we consider conformal metrics? So, first reason is so, from personal from my personal point of view, I think conformal metric is really easy way to construct new metric. Okay? As long as you have a Riemannian metric and you have a smooth function, so then you can multiply them together to, con uh, to construct a new Riemannian metric. Okay? So in fact, this gives you an infinite number of ways to construct Riemannian metrics right? as, as long as you have a smooth function. And second property here is, uh, so this is a good thing about conformal metrics is, in fact, conformal metrics preserve angle between two tangent vectors, okay? So which just follows from this formula, okay? If you take uh, th this function, gxy over gxx squared with gyy, then this is equal to the right-hand side, okay? And in fact, this is cosine law, right? Cosine of the angle between these two vectors it is given by this. Right? So therefore, it really preserves the angles. Okay, from linear algebra. Okay. So this this is uh, a good properties about conformal metric. And third one is, in fact, being conformal to is an equivalence relation. Okay. So uh, you, you once again, you just check. So G is conformal to G itself. If you take f equals to one, okay. If g is reflexive, g is conformal to g naught. Then you just take multiply f inverse on both sides. Then reflexive. <coughs> Transitive is also pretty easy. Okay. So so in fact, this is an equivalence relation. So therefore, you can talk about conformal class. Ah, uh, you can talk about equivalent class, right? And the equivalent class is exactly called conformal class. Okay. And once once again, solve it. Can you see it from the back? Hello. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So last line saying this is called conformal class. Okay. okay. So then, uh, so if you are following, then I can tell you a very classical theorem uh, in uh, differential geometry. So it's uh, it's called uniformization theorem. So uh, is that the following? So if you have a compact uh, two-dimensional smooth manifold, so, or this is a compact surface. Okay, you have a compact surface, <coughs> and we have a given Riemannian metric on this surface. Then uniformization theorem says the following. Okay, 
for this given metric g dot, uh, we can always find a conformal metric. Okay. We can always find a conformal a metric conformal to g dot such that its Gaussian curvature is constant. Okay. So, uh, in fact, there is many ways to stay uniformization theorem, but this is one of the ways which I would like to stay using conformal metrics. <coughs> okay. So, and in fact, uh, so the consequence of uniformization is this. So, in fact, we can classify all the compact uh, to surface, uh, two-dimensional manifold, when when the Gaussian curvature is constant. Okay. So we know that either if this is genius zero, then this is sphere. If genius is one, then this is torus, and this is high genius case. Okay. So uh, in fact, we can classify all these surfaces when the Gaussian curvature is constant. So therefore, the cons uh, the the one of the corollary of the previous theorem is this. In fact, we, we know that any surface, any compact two-dimensional manifold is, is one of this, okay. according to its genius. Uh, if genius is zero, then we know this, this must be sphere. If genius is one, then that is the torus. And this is the high genius case. So, and this can be, in fact, uh, stated as a problem or, or a theorem in PDE. In fact, if you write your conformal metric G and ex as exponential of 2U multiplied G dot, then we know that the Gaussian curvature change in this way. Okay, so here, uh, this is the Laplacian of G dot, and this is the Gaussian curvature of G dot, and this is Gaussian curvature of G. So, which means, Uniformization theorem sets. We, we can always solve this PDE. We can always solve this elliptic uh, second order type PDE such that left hand side is constant. Okay. Yeah, if you put it as a PDE here. Okay, so we, we have a question here. So we would like to ask so, can we generalize this? Can we generalize? the uniformization theorem to high dimension. Okay. So uh, and in fact it really depends on what kind of curvature quantities you you, you talk about. Okay. If you want if you are from complex geometry point of view, then you have the Taylor Einstein metric. Right. And if you have uh, if you are from Riemannian geometry, then you have uh, scalar curvature, then you have the Amabi problem. So and today we, uh, I want to tell you Q curvature, okay? So one of the possible generalization of this uniformization theorem is Q curvature. So which I am going to tell you. So are you ready, so? Yeah, yes, please. no. Yeah. Anyone ready? <laughs> okay, yeah, and this one is ready. <laughs> okay, so that I will tell you what Q curvature is. Okay, so, so suppose you have a compact a uh, four-dimensional manifold, okay. Riemannian manifold. So then Q curvature is defined as this, as the right-hand side. So here, uh, Rg is the scalar curvature, and uh, this is uh, Ricci, and so this is uh, square Ricci long square, okay. So give you five seconds to look at it. Time's up. Uh, okay, so and I, I'm pretty sure maybe most of you is the first time seeing this formula, right? So therefore, let me do an example. Okay, if this is the first time you you see this formula, let me do an example. So assume this is Einstein. Okay, so suppose your your metric is Einstein metric, and then I want to compute the Q curve. Okay, so ready? Hello. <laughs> okay. So which is, uh, so so Einstein manifold, which means which is proportional to to your metric. So then we can compute scalar curvature by taking the trace. So dimension is four, so this is four lambda. 
and we also compute the Ricci long square, uh, just uh, which is just the right hand side. But you substitute the Einstein condition into here, so we get once again the dimension is four, so you get four lambda square. So then, if you come uh, plug this, uh, put this into the formula of Q curvature, then you get this, right? First term vanishes, because this is constant, okay? So Laplacian is <coughs> constant uh, zero. So therefore, the remaining term is uh, minus 16 lambda square plus 12 lambda square. So this is two-third, two-third lambda square, okay? And w one of the important things is this is always not that. Q curvature for Einstein manifold always long negative. Good. Uh, why do we have to assume the dimension of the manifold? Uh, yeah, very good question. So we don't need to do that. But, uh, so you are 10 minutes ahead of us. Uh, 10 okay. minutes later, I just because I have to leave earlier. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Will you leave in 10 minutes? Like, if you stay long enough, I will tell you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Like, uh, okay, good. So, and something uh, closely related to Q curvature is something called Penny's operator. Okay. So Penny's operator is defined as this. So once again, this is Laplacian, Laplacian square, and uh, so this is uh, the lecture D and. Uh, the exterior differentiation, and D star is the adjoint, uh, adjoint of D with respect to the metric. So therefore, uh, you should interpret this formula in this way, okay? So which means when you take the inner product with another function, you put the D to the other side, okay? So you put the D to the, to the, to the V2, okay? So which is, you should interpret this formula as. So uh, then I will talk about the properties of Penny's operator. But before doing this, so you may still wonder why we call this Q curvature, right? So why, why do you call this Q curvature? Is it related to uh, what? Cotrellian or something like this? Like, so actually the, the answer is very simple. I have asked someone. So the reason is, so in fact Penny's operator was first constructed. So Penny's operator was first constructed. Then later they construct Q curvature. Okay. And the next character of P is Q. Okay. <laughs> Therefore they call it Q curvature. <laughs> I'm not sure it's true or not, but at least that's the story I, I heard. Okay. Uh, so uh, here are some properties of Penny's. So first is so. If you interpret the Penny's operator in this way, it's very easy to say this is self-adjoint, right? So, because uh, Laplacian is self-adjoint, this is symmetric, so, so therefore, yeah, Penny's is self-adjoint. This is almost immediate from the formula. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, still the, the formula for Penny's. So another property you can see here is uh, constant functions is always in the kernel. Because if you take constant function, Laplacian of constant zero, d of constant is zero. This is always uh, constant function always lies inside the kernel. And in fact, one of the very important question here is when this will become equality. We would like to to see under what kind of condition we have equality here. So th this is basically one of the open questions uh, in this direction. Uh, okay, so third property here is, uh, you, you can also see this is the leading term, right? Laplacian square is the leading term, so n plus the lower order terms. So therefore you see that this is a fourth order operator. Okay. So therefore from PDE point of view it's not so good, so because this is higher order. But at least this is elliptic, because the leading term is Laplace square. Okay, but, and the most important property here is, so for Q curvature, so if you change the metric conformally, so Q curvature and Penny's operator change very nicely, okay? 
So namely, if g equals to exponential of 2 u g naught, then q curvature, the q curvature relate, are related by this. And the Penny's operator is related by this. Okay, it changed extremely nicely. As actually, so as actually, so, so at least for me, so I will compare this formula to two dimension. Okay, so in the two dimensional case, if you change the metric conformally, so this is the formula I gave you uh, ten minutes ago. Right? Then the Gaussian curvature change in this way. Right? Remember that? Yeah, and the Laplacian change in this way when you change the metric conformally. So therefore, if you compare these two formula, you see the correspondence, right? So the correspondence is this. In two-dimensional psi, you have the negative of Laplacian, which is corresponding to, in the four-dimensional psi, you have the Penny's, okay? And in the two-dimensional psi, you have Gaussian curvature here, and in four-dimensional psi, you have Q curvature. Okay. So, so, right. Other than that, the formulation looks similar. Can you just like explain mm -hmm. why the Q-curvature is interesting? Like, what's the purpose of this? Yeah, and uh, one, once again, next slide. <laughs> 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 you are also like two minutes ahead of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I will give you one more reason why mm -hmm. why you have this kind of performance. Okay. So if others are ready. Okay. So so in fact. So another reason why this we have this correspondence is, is this. Okay. In fact, by by Gauss bonnet theorem, we, we can see that the so-called the total Gaussian curvature is uh, is a conformal invariant. So total Gaussian curvature means you just integrate it. Okay. You just integrate over the manifold. And in fact, by Gauss bonnet theorem, we know that this must be a topological invariant. Right. So this is always equals to two pi multiply its Euler characteristics. And in a four-dimensional case, you have the same thing. In fact, in four-dimensional <coughs> case side, you have so-called the churn gauss bonnet theorem, <coughs> okay, which is written in, in this way. Okay, you have integral of Q curvature plus uh, the, the long square of Wow tensor, which is equal to uh, 8 pi square, multiply the Euler characteristics. Okay, so so then from this formula you see, so this is a topological invariant. It doesn't depend on the metric at all. And at the same time, in the dimensional form, so this is a pawnwise conformal invariant. In fact, so if you change the metric conformally, so then pawnwisely this is equal. So in particular, so these is invariant under conformal change. This is a topological invariant. So this implies the total Q curvature is also a conformal invariant. Okay. Is a number only depends on the conformal class. Okay. So 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 therefore so what, once again it, it's kind of explains the correspondence, right? The total Q curvature corresponding to the total total Gaussian curvature is corresponding to the total Q curvature. Okay. And So in, in fact, okay. So and so here maybe it's good to mention the example again. So in fact, if you remember the example I calculated, right, the Einstein manifold. <coughs> so uh, so when the metric is Einstein, so which means which is proportional to the metric G, we we computed. We have computed the Q curve here, right? This is equals to two thirds of lambda square. Mm -hmm. So now put, put it back, put it back to the churn gauss bonnet theorem. So then you see that uh, so this is long negative, right? So Q curvature is long negative. Of course, uh, the long square is long negative, always. So therefore, you see that the Euler characteristics must be long negative. So that means I already have a corollary. Right? Any Einstein four-dimensional manifold, so th this must have non-negative Euler characteristics. Okay. Or put it in another way: if you have a manifold, its Euler characteristics is negative, 
it cannot be Einstein. Never. Okay. It gives you an obstruction. Okay. And in fact, you, you have something better do it, uh, due to Hitchin. Hitchin inequalities tell us, uh, in fact, the, you have even a lower bound. If you have a four-dimensional Einstein metric, then the, the Euler characteristic is bounded below by the absolute value of signature. Okay, and uh, any questions? Yeah, okay. Okay, so, so going back to your question is, so now we can go to higher dimension, in fact. So in fact, for any given even dimensional manifold, so Fetterman and Graham, uh, they, they, they can define a notion of Q curvature. <coughs> and they can also define a Penny's operator, so such that it has all the good properties I talk about. So first thing is, uh, this is self-adjoint. So this is a self-adjoint operator, such that the leading term is this one. Okay. So minus Laplacian uh, n, n over 2. But the other property is uh, it's also changed nicely when you ch the Q curvature changed nicely when you change the metric component. Uh, it also, yeah, it also has the property that uh, the total Q curvature is a conformal invariant. Okay, so but the, the disadvantage of this, so, so therefore we, we can define, in fact, we can define Q curvature and Penny's operator for higher <laughs> even dimensional manifold. But the disadvantage here is no explicit formula for this. No. Okay, we, we cannot write down the general formula. We only know that this exists. Uh, so the reason is because we, they constructed this using something called MDN metric. So they, they, they know the formula, uh, they know that this exists, but cannot write down the general formula. Uh, except some special case. Okay? So for some some really nice manifold. For example, for the sphere, which I told you at the beginning of the talk. So for the, this standard metric, so then you can write this down. Then the Q curvature is constant, which is equal to n minus 1 factorial. Uh, you can also write down the Penny's operator. And uh, for Euclidean space, you can also do that, which is also the example I told you at the beginning. Uh, so in this case, Euclidean metric is uh, the Q curvature vanishes, and uh, the Penny's is really this. So you don't have lower all the time. Okay. So if you are following <coughs> until now, so I would like to. So we would like to ask two questions. Okay. So that is the uniformization theorem. Uh, so you just mimic the uniformization theorem in a two-dimensional case. So, which is this? I want to find a conformal metric such that the Q curvature is constant, okay. which is like the two-dimensional surface case. Okay. And more generally, we would like to ask this. So we want to prescribe it. We want to prescribe the Q curvature, uh, namely. Given any f smooth function on this manifold, can we find a conformal metric such that its Q curvature is exactly this f? So, of course, if you take f to be constant, this reduces to question one. And uh, and th this is, in fact, can be put as a problem in PDE, right? So, because remember, if you change the metric conformally. So you have this formula. So which means you want to solve this n-order elliptic PDE such that Q curvature is constant or Q curvature is f. Okay. So you want to solve this n-order elliptic PDE. <coughs> The first result in this direction is due to uh, uh, Paul Yang and Alice Chan. So they, they, they proved this. Uh, they proved that on a compact uh, four-dimensional manifold, such that 
is the MAP invariant is not negative. And also, this is a very technical condition, such that the kernel only contains constant function, okay? which I told you at the beginning. Right? Like, this is a really an open question in this thing. So, uh, such that the total Q curvature is less than the sphere one. So then the answer becomes positive. So we can find uh, a Q uh, metric such that the Q curvature is concave. Okay. Which means this answer question one. This, uh, this answer question one. At least for four dimensions. Okay, and uh, so before I go to uh, next slide is, in fact, the proof is very ancient. The, the technique is very ancient, which means they define a functional, and then they want to look at the minimizer, and then prove that the minimizer exists, and the minimizer has this property. So this is uh, the variational approach. They define the functional, and then uh, decrease this functional, look at the minimizer, and then prove that the minimizer has constant filter. So, and the approach I want to see is the flow approach. If the other approach is you, you, you try to flow your metric until it becomes minimizer, which is uh, the next 30 minutes, I think. Sorry, uh, yeah. about the consistent mm. kernel is equal to constant? Is that yeah. a very natural condition that one imposed? Yeah, very good question. I, uh, I would I, I would put it in that way. Uh, it's lecture in the proof. <laughs> So, so, so the proof use this condition in every possible way, okay? But it, it's not lecture in the sense that, you know, we, we don't know without this condition, is this true? We, we don't know. <coughs> yeah. So, yeah, we, we would like to yeah. say something. So, so for, for the flow approach, you will also need that. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So this is lecture in the proof. Yeah, because the proof just essentially is this kind of But but I, I can uh, yeah maybe once again ten minutes later. So th I, I will show you some example. <coughs> this condition does not have. We we have metric <coughs> such that the kernel doesn't only contain contain constant function. Yeah, they are all. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so the other approach is slow. Okay, so uh, which uh, I would like to talk about for the next ten minutes. So the flow is this. So uh, I would like to deform the metric according to this. Okay, so uh, alpha is just a constant. Okay, so alpha is a constant. You, you just want to fix the volume. Okay, but mainly what I want you to pay attention is this. So you want to deform the metric according to the difference, okay, Q minus F, okay. Eventually, I want to deform the metric such that this becomes zero, okay. Q equals to F, then I'm done, right. I prescribe it. I prescribe the Q curvature to be F. Uh, okay. uh, so for the time being, I would call this QF. And uh, we have some good properties about this flow. Uh, for example, so property number one is, so the station, the stationary point of this flow uh, is the things we wanted, okay? Q curvature equals to alpha f up to some, uh, equals f up to some constant. So, and uh, it's easy to see, because uh, if this is stationary point, which means the uh, left hand side is zero, so which force the right hand side to be zero, which means th this vanishes, right? Q equals to alpha f. Okay? So the stationary point is exactly the things you want. You want to prescribe the, the, the Q curvature to be f up to some constant. Okay? Property number two here is, uh, this is also good. So in fact, this is a conformal flow. Okay? Uh, this is a conformal in a, this is a conformal flow in the sense that it preserves the conformal structure. So, which means when you deform it, when you deform the metric, it will not go to another conformal class. Okay. So, and the proof is also extremely easy. Uh, you just consider this. Okay. 
So as long as the solution exists, you can define the quantity on the right hand side. And 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 this is uh, this is you can verify this is really solution uh, of this flow. And, and this is conformal, right? This is conformal to theta. Does it make sense? Yeah. Hello. Okay, so therefore, because it preserves the conformal structure, as long as the solution exists, it's always conformal to the previous, uh, the initial metric, you can write the uh, Q curvature flow to be this. Right? You just plug this back to the flow equation. You, you see that this is uh, equivalent to the, the original flow, is equivalent to the flow of the conformal factor. Okay? You just deform the, the conformal factor U. And from this, you, you see that also, as I said, in fact, the flow preserve more than. Okay, this is also a pretty easy calculation. So because uh, the, the the solution G T can be written as exponential of two U T, so the volume form is, is related by this, right? So you just multiply n n over two, right? So therefore, if you take the derivative, you, you see that uh, and using this equation, you see that the volume form change in this way. Right? Pretty, pretty easy calculation. So you, you have some graduate students here. Right? So you should do it one time in your life, <laughs> <laughs> and then they forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so, oops, sorry. Right. So therefore, oh, okay. On the last slide, I didn't work. So therefore, if, we, if you take the integration, you, you see that this is zero. Okay. Yeah. If you take the, the, the integration here, this becomes zero. I don't know why I missed that. Yeah. Uh, it's zero, that's because they're short for alpha t, right? Exactly. Exactly. So if I integrate this, yeah, b then because of the choice of alpha t, yeah. Let me let me show. Yeah. Let me show you. Yeah, because of this alpha t. Okay. That's very good. Because of the choice of alpha t. When, when you integrate this, this becomes t. Okay. okay, lastly, so in fact, the flow is very good compared to, maybe you heard about which flow. So compared to which flow, this is extremely good, good flow because this is strictly parabolic. Okay, not only would be parabolic, but in fact this is a strictly parabolic PDE. Why? Because once again you write the flow uh, because this is conformal, Q curvature change in this way. So therefore substitute this into the flow equation of the conformal factor, so it becomes this. Okay. It, it looks complicated, but yeah, the, you just need to look at two terms. First term is left hand side you have t derivative of u, right hand side you have this term, okay, which is the higher order term is the Laplacian. So therefore, this is a heat equation type equation, right? Parabolic type. Right? Left hand side is t derivative, right hand side is Laplacian. La 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 so this is parabolic type. <coughs> So which proof this. And and the last property here is so therefore we have short time existence immediately because this is a strictly parabolic PDE. Okay. So compared to which flow is is much easier. Right? Even proving the short time existence require a lot of work. Because which flow <coughs> is not it is not parabolic, but this is parabolic. Twenty, twenty. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. So, uh, so using this flow, uh, Simon Brando he proved this. Uh, he proved that, uh, in fact, uh, under this flow, if uh, the if the function is a positive function, and, and once again we have the technical condition, so the kernel is assumed to be constant, uh, and also the total Q curvature less than the sphere one. So then he can prove that the flow uh, long he can prove that the long time exists. The flow always exists and it also converges. So
So it converges to the things we wanted. Okay, this limiting metric, the Q curvature equals to F, up to constant. Okay. But we can always take away this constant by rescaling. Okay. So this, this so therefore this uh, answer question is So, but uh, so go, going back to yeah, your question is so like but so uh, Paul Yang, Paul Yang and Alice Chan there, and also Sam Brando, they're here on here. So they they excluded this case, right? So if the kernel is not equals constant, so the theorem is excluded th this. Right? So. So for example, in fact, this is the example. So if we consider the polar metric, so if we consider the uh, the polar manifold, this is the sphere, F2, uh, taking the polar with the higher genius surfaces. Then uh, by just by the formula, if you substitute this uh, into the formula of Penny's operator, so then you can calculate this. Okay, So it's equals to the right-hand side. Then, it, uh, then you can see that in fact the kernel contain constant other something other than constant function. Okay, so uh, if I let's see if I remember co correctly is if you take other fun other function from one of this, so this will vanishes. <coughs> so therefore, con other than constant function, so pennies of op kernel of this pennies operator also contain the. Uh, Argon function of one of this. Okay. So therefore, this, this is not satisfied. Uh, but uh, so, but uh, they uh, they they put some existing results uh, also using the flow without this condition. Okay. So they they can do that. And on the other hand, if you look at the theorem of Alice and Paul and, and uh, John Brando, the theorem, so you also see that uh, it excluded the case of sphere, right? Because, uh, <coughs> let me show you very quickly. So if you look at, for example, Brando's theorem, yes, so they require this uh, inequality to be straight, right? So you need to be strictly less than the sphere. So therefore, Brando theorem or uh, Paul and Alice their theorem also excluded the case of spin, right? Because if you have a metric G, G not conformal to the standard metric, and remember this is a conformal invariant, right? So therefore, this is always equals to this, right? So therefore, their theorem doesn't apply. Right? So, and you, we we have to consider sphere uh, independently. Because that's that strict inequality doesn't satisfy. Okay, so so therefore here comes uh, uh, Brando and uh, the work of myself. So what what I did um, so Brando did it for dimension four, and I, I did it for general cases. So uh, we, I consider the Q curvature flow on the sphere. Okay. So here, here is uh, I take the mean. So I, I can prove that in fact the the flow exists. So you have long time existence, and we also have convergence. And the convergence is much stronger. In fact, it doesn't just converge to constant field curvature metric, but constant sectional curvature. Okay, this is what I can prove. Something much stronger than the previous one. And uh, so, so therefore, this answer question one, question one for sphere. And for for question two about the piecewise curvature, so this is uh, so in dimension four, this is due to Maggioli and Ruby, and for high dimension, this is due to myself and independently with uh, Chen and Xu in Nanjing University. So what, what we can prove is uh, almost the same thing, but for the piecewise curvature flow. So we can prove that this uh, exists and also converges to the things we wanted. We can piecewise this Q curvature to the F, but uh, but uh, under some condition. Okay. 
So, so therefore, this answers question two. And uh, yeah, let me at least show you the idea of the proof. Yeah, you say okay if I prove it. Like, that for some reason in Korea, like students really hated proof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I don't. Like every time I say proof, they say, oh no, no, please. <laughs> uh, at least, uh, okay. Oh, uh, here the remark here is, uh, so here I assume F is positive, but later I can kind of remove this condition. Uh, if I only require this to be positive somewhere, still okay. Okay, so this is the idea of proof. Uh, so we define this functional. Okay, uh, so so this functional uh, is defined in this way. So uh, you may ask where this functional coming from, right? So in fact, this is from the variational type problem. Okay, we borrow it to our flow problem. So that so far I can answer this. So and good thing about this is, so if you consider the flow, okay. So assume this is the solution of the flow. So then if you put this u into this functional, so then you see that the energy is decreasing. Okay. Uh, put it in a more technical term is, uh, the Q curvature flow is negative gradient flow of this functional. Okay. Put it in a little bit more technical way. And so from all the negative gradient flow, yeah, so in particular, if you integrate this, so if you integrate this from zero to infinity, you see that this is bounded. Okay? This is bounded by the initial energy and the lower bound of this energy. So and in particular, so going back to analysis, we know that, we, we know that the limit in of the L2 long is zero. Okay? If you have a function such that if you integrate this from zero to infinity is finite, then the limit in with zero. Okay. But what we want to prove convergence when we want to prove convergence is we want to prove that the limit should be zero. Okay. But from, from this very basic machinery, we already get a limit in zero. Okay. So this is the first idea of the proof. Uh, are you tired? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> okay, so next thing I, I want to talk about is uh, just related to sound Okay. Uh, so, um, here is, uh, suppose I have a manifold, maybe a long comeback. So, in the previous proof. Yes. Uh, where did the special about the shift? We are doing it for the shift. Oh. So, where, where do you use the condition? For the sphere, ah, okay. Um, yeah, it's not written here, but uh, but we we need to have some kinds some kinds of Hobbes inequality. So Hobbes inequality is that uh, it is that so that uh, so under some kinds of symmetry of the sphere, so then you can Im improve the Sobel inequality. So. So that that is already classic. This is already using the Yanagi problem. So and similar stuff is true for the King here. So, so that, that 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 point we use the fact that this is a manifold. Uh, this is the street. The manifold is the street. So we we, do, we need to we need to have some kind of improved solar for, for the sphere of things. There should, there should be more than there should be more steps than what is Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. But that is one of the particular steps we, we need to use the fact that this is a Yeah, using some kind of symmetry. So, but that I, I, yeah, I didn't show it here. So. Yeah, does it answer the question? Well, uh, don't show it. Yeah, <laughs> I got it. Yeah, uh, yeah, let's, let me, for the last 10 minutes, let me talk about the Q solitron. Okay, so we, we say that uh, uh, GT is a Q curvature solitron. So if, uh, if it satisfies these two conditions, okay? 
So first is uh, GT can be written as uh, some some function. Okay, this is a smooth function sigma t, and uh, psi t is a uh, is a family of diffeomorphism. Okay, but you pull it back. Okay, you pull back the initial metric. Okay, so at at the same time, this is a solution of Q curvature flow. Okay. So sometimes we we call soniton to be the self-similar solution, right? Self-similar solution of the flow. Right? Why? Because because of this because of this equation. Okay. This is self-similar in this sense. First, you you we scale the metric, okay, by sigma t by some constant, right? So and at the same time, this is self-similar in the sense that this is pullback of the initial metric. Right. The shape is very similar to the to the initial metric. Okay. So this is the, the general idea of solid. Okay. Uh, yeah. Before I move on to the next slide, so I maybe some of you heard about which is on the top. Okay. Which is on the demo is which is on the top. Which is on the top is which is on the top is. Okay, this can be written as this form, and this is the solution of which you flow. Okay, so then that will be the which is on. Okay, so uh, soliton is important to understand the singularity of the flow. So uh, what we we did is uh, Chen, Chen from Nanjing University, and I myself. Okay, so uh, so the first direction, our uh, first result in this direction is. So we can prove that any compact uh, Q curvature soliton is the trivial one. So this must have constant Q curvature. And uh, so we, we have some other results in the paper. Uh, but uh, still, this is far from being done. In fact, uh, what we want to do is we, yeah, right. We, we have constructed some, some example in the long compact case. Uh, but this is far from being done because uh, eventually we want to classify all of them. So we, we want to classify all the <coughs> Q curvature solid. Okay. Are you tired? Okay. If I keep going, <laughs> don't hate me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so so far, okay, so so far we uh, we assume the manifold has no boundary. Right? So now we want to assume, yeah, we ask the following question: What if M uh, has boundary? Okay, for example, if you have a surface, so if M is a compact uh, surface with a boundary, okay, so then we still have uniformization field, okay. So and we have two cases. So the first case is. Uh, so there exists a conformal metric such that the Gaussian curvature is constant, uh, but the, on the boundary, the geodesic curvature vanishes. Okay, this is the first case. And second case is so this time we assume that in the interior, the Gaussian curvature vanishes, and the geodesic curvature become constant. Okay, so uh, for the first case. Uh, you have the sphere, okay? You have um, for for the first case, you have you have the upper upper handle sphere in that. So for the first case, you have the S two plus. So this is this is the con so in the in, in the in the interior, the Gaussian curvature is constantly goes to one, but on the boundary, it, because in the equator, so this is geodesic. So therefore, the geodesic curvature vanishes. Okay, so this is the, the first case. And for the second case, you have the flat disk. Right? In fact, the example of this is the D2. So such that in, in, in the interior, the Gaussian curvature vanishes. But on, on the boundary, the geodesic curvature is constant. Well, th this is what I said, right? Uh -huh. th this is the, the picture on the board. Okay, and, and once again, you can state this as a 
uh, as they feel on the PDE. And uh, so similarly, we can generalize this to high dimension. Okay. For example, if M is a four-dimensional manifold with boundary, so then in the interior you still have Q curvature. <coughs> and but at this time on the boundary you have some something called P3. Okay, which uh, of course I don't have time define, defining. But this is introduced by Alice Chen and Ting Jie. Uh, and so and once again it changed very nicely conformally. So and uh, so under some assumption, so uh, so uh, she she can prove that uh, so for the boundary for the for the case with boundary. So she can prove that uh, existence of the metric, the constant Q curvature, and the zero T curvature. Okay, and and she she also considered the flow. I think. Yeah, right here. Okay. So, okay. so and yeah, th thank you for your attention, and I will stop here. Is there a conceptual way to understand the kernel of P? Conceptual way. Yeah. Mm. What kind of conceptual way? Because right now, around? for me, it just looks like uh, it's just defined as by the formula, and it mm -hmm. means nothing geometrically yeah. or topologically to me. And Right, I right. wonder if there's a way to look at this. Yeah, like some geometric way. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe the, the point, yeah, maybe the key point of solving the problem of like of proving or it only con contains the constant function is interpret this in, in geometric way. But at this moment, I don't know. Maybe for some example, <coughs> yeah, one can do that. But generally, I don't know. Yeah, but maybe maybe it's good direction yeah, to look at it yeah, from a geometric point of view. Yeah. At, at this moment, I don't know. I also haven't started out with uh, uh, we have a uh, concentrated compact. <coughs> so 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 one one key what and other key point is we have concentration compactness mm -hmm. for argument in here. So which means either either the flow converge mm -hmm. or it concentrate at certain point. And so and one of one of the key steps is how can we prove that in fact concentration doesn't doesn't exist. Right. Okay. So, so, yeah, so, um, yeah, like, like, uh, at this moment, <laughs> I cannot tell you this is, yeah, yeah too technical, so. Yeah, I, I know, so that's why I'm, I'm thinking, how can you get it? <laughs> right, yeah. But maybe we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the 
sure it must be incomplete in some way. Of course, of course, right. Like where, 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 where is the step that you needed that you had to steal? Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, also. People try to do that. Okay. So some people try to define the Q curvature on the off dimensional manifold. But uh, let me show you really quick. But this <coughs> time the operator become like pseudo differential operator. It's no longer a differential operator because of this reason. Okay. 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 Yeah. You have a fractional order. But it's not still it's not too bad. Right? This is fractional order. Uh, uh, but this is no longer a differential operator, right? Because the leading term is different. Yeah, that's enough. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Space will stay. Not, not leaving early. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.